Hello, and welcome back to Book Lust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today at Folio Seattle is novelist, mystery writer, Sujata Massey. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm so happy you made the trip here, oh, and we're in this wonderful book-lined room at Folio Seattle. So tell me how, how your mystery career, mystery writing career began. Oh, it's, it's been a rather long one. It began in Japan many years ago in the early 1990s when I was living there for a couple of years when my husband was a, was a young officer in the Navy. And I didn't have much to do with myself, so I started trying to write a mystery. And that first mystery was about a young Japanese-American woman called Rei Shimura. And I have devoted about 11 books to her adventures. And now I'm writing a whole new mystery series set in India. Yes, with Praveen Mystery yes. is, the, is the main character, a young woman, barrister. She's actually uh, a solicitor. A solicitor. I always get those two yeah, confused. Yeah, the solicitors are the lawyers who um, do not um, speak in court, but they're the ones that do all kinds of paperwork type mm -hmm. legal procedures. And in those days, women were not allowed to address the bar but they could work as solicitors. And yes, and so the ones set in Japan with a Japanese-American woman were set in the present, right? That's right. And this and the, this new series is historical India. I mean, India before independence. Yeah, the, um, the Purveen novels start in 1921. Right. And the early 20s was a good period for me to write in. World War I was over, so I would not be involved in that type of a story, right. but women didn't yet have the right to work as the barrister, as I was explaining. Right. So there was a lot of freedom fighting going on, too. Mahatma Gandhi was active and living in Bombay. He, wa he was a lawyer, mm -hmm. and so he was um, doing all kinds of work that Praveen would have learned about. So I. I feel like with this time period, I can write about women's rights, I can write about um, Indian rights, yes. and then there's also that fabulous 1920s world with the cars and the cocktails and, um, you know, it just a little bit before the deco period, right. so I enjoy that a whole lot. I, I just loved, one of the things I loved about your books was the sense of history that I got. I mean, I, I always feel that any, any book I read, I learn things from, and even, even novels, I, I feel like I learn things from. And, and your novels about Praveen, there's so much of India that I, that, so much about India that I learned, and the princely states, which were not under, which, which were not the same as, well, you explain the princely states to me. Okay, during the period that Britain was in, in control of India, right. or the subcontinent, they really had a little more than half of the subcontinent that they were calling British India. Mm -hmm. The rest of it was this patchwork of kingdoms that were overseen by Muslim, Hindu, and Sikh um, kings, mm -hmm. and they were called either Maharajas or Nawabs, and the British said, we'll let you keep this land, but you need to get along with us, you can't band together, you're not going to rise up against us, and in return we'll help you, we'll protect you from anyone who might want to take over your kingdom. And that was something that had been going on for hundreds of years, there were these skirmishes and mm -hmm. kings taking each other's properties. So the, the, the Maharajas went along with it, and they also agreed to be called princes, because now they were, they were not real bona fide rulers, they were princes right. that were part of the empire. Yeah, I, I just thought that was so interesting, because when we tend to think of, of India under British rule, we tend to think of the whole subcontinent as being totally red, you know, the sun yes. never sets. On, on the British Empire, but here were these whole groups of, of princely states, and and your new book, the Sadapur Moonstone, is set in one of those princely states. Yes, um, that I created a state that was in an area that there really were a lot of states uh -huh. in the mountains that were outside of Bombay and Pune, and Praveen has been asked by the British government to go and investigate 
the condition of a young prince who was living there. And his father has passed away, so the people in charge of him are his mother and mother and the mother-in-law. Right. And they don't want to speak to any British gentleman because of their rank. They're in Porta, and they don't speak to men. But because she's a woman lawyer, she she can speak to them. They yes. they really can't say no. And they had asked asked for help because right. they were worried about him and worried about his education and maybe worried about his safety. So yeah, that's the setup. Yes. For and how yeah, the and, and such a disagreement between the mother of this little boy who is now the heir apparent mm -hmm. to the, to the throne of yeah. um, of of that state and the mother-in-law who doesn't want to let go of all the yeah. power that she has. I kind of like that dynamic between yeah. those two women. Yeah. Um well, it, the education of a Maharaja was really, really important. Mm -hmm. The British had the right to decide where he would go to boarding school and where he would go to college or if he'd be tutored at home. And the goal was for him to get the kind of education where he would feel positive about the British and but not so educated that he might say, this is socially unjust what's going on right. and we need to do more. We need to, I want to change my state. Right. So it was a really delicate balance and Perveen knows that when she's going in there and she happens to be this idealistic young lawyer who's interested in the freedom movement. Yes, so, and a big supporter of Gandhi. Yes, so, she, yes. so she, she's thinking, what can I do that's right for this boy? And honestly, my client is the British government. So she yeah. has a real, really challenging situation. Now, how did you, this is the second book in the Praveen series, so I have a couple questions. D it, did you choose the last name Mystery as, as a kind of tribute to Rohinton Mystery? I thought who writes those wonderful novels, Canadian Indian novels. He is novelist. a great writer, and yes. he happens to be a Parsi. It's yes. a Parsi name. Yes. Oh, it is. Uh, yes. yes, and it, it, it actually means construction. And so maybe far, far back in his lineage, oh. there was someone who was a builder, and mm -hmm. I've made it clear that that's the same in Perveen's right. life. But honestly, I loved when I saw the name Mystery and I learned it was, you know, it was a Parsi name. I was thinking, oh, it's the great name for a mystery series. Yes. Because that right. way you will know the right. book is a mystery. All right. you have to know is her first name. Right. It all comes it all comes together. <laughs> well, it was interesting to me that you made Perveen a Parsi. Um, rather than a Muslim or a Hindu mm -hmm. or a Sikh, which when you're reading uh, in Indian fiction, those are normally the the um, the religions that the mm -hmm. main characters are. How did that come about? Well, in my own background, my father is from India, and there is a long line of lawyers in our family. And the, as I started working on my books with my dad, you know, and when I say I talked with him, uh -huh. I, he gave me counsel very similar <laughs> to the relationship between Praveen and her own father. Right. Um, you know, I, I learned we had these lawyers and maybe that was part of my interest. But the early women lawyers in India did have Parsi heritage, not oh. Hindu heritage. So I felt oh. to be accurate that I wanted to, you know, give the community the credit for mm -hmm. having having encouraged women to to be lawyers. Why, why do you think that was? That the, I mean, the Parsis mm -hmm. originally came from Iran mm -hmm. and, and settled in India. Um, but So why do you why? think they had more freedom well, than the other? In, in the city of Bombay, that was the place where more Parsis were than anywhere else in India, although they had originally landed in Gujarat. Mm -hmm. The British encouraged the Parsis to begin moving to Bombay with them in the 1600s after Britain got the gift of that area from the Portuguese. And they, they knew the Parsis were good builders, so they said, please come. And with, with that shift, the Parsis became very prosperous and they began going into professions. Mm -hmm. And at the time of this book, the early 20th century, one third of the lawyers in Bombay were Parsis. So, so that is that makes it very likely for, for such a small minority population right. to take to be so active in law right. made it more likely that women would be encouraged in that profession because there was this whole network of, of Parsi lawyers uh -huh. there. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, how did are you someone who when you're reading for pleasure 
it, it, are mysteries your what you read, or are how, what do you what are you reading? Oh, I, I definitely read mysteries for uh -huh. pleasure. I love old mysteries. Mysteries Josephine Tate oh, me is too. one of the people I just you know I sit at her feet. Right. Yes. Um, a writer I read recently that I really enjoy is Angie Kim, who's uh -huh. got a book Miracle Creek. So. I, I love a good legal thriller, actually. Um, I like all kinds of mysteries, but I'm really, I'm really drawn. You know, the more that I, that I study law without having right. gone to law school, <laughs> the more interested I am in seeing, in, in reading legal thrillers and, and looking at the way law is used to tell stories in, in an interesting way. Uh -huh. when, when you were doing, how much research did you have to do for these, these two mm. books? I mean, because you weren't living in India. Yeah. I mean, it's unlike when you were in Japan and you kind of could, and writing those um, Ray Shimura books. Well, right before I started the Purveen series, I wrote a standalone book called the, the Sleeping Dictionary that was published in 2012. Uh -huh. And that book, actually 2013, um, that book had a whole lot of India research. So I sort of did years for the Sleeping Dictionary, uh -huh. including a lot of research on the history of women professionals in India and oh, okay. women in the freedom movement. So I was able to sort of tag on to that. From there, I began reading about the history of law in India and consulting with um, you know scholars on that those matters. Uh -huh and traveling there. Um, fortunately, I have relatives who live in Mumbai, uh, and so I was able to, to go and visit a lot of the places and get a lot of good leads on uh -huh. what to do. And, and so you sort of imbued yourself with, with, um, with India and, and was able to transport yourself back to the 1920s yeah. for, for these. Well, one of the nicest things about Mumbai is there are big sections of South Bombay that are still preserved. I mean, there are buildings, there are hotels you can go into that were around at the turn of the century, like the Taj Mahal Palace right. Hotel. There are social clubs like the Royal Bombay Yacht Club. Um, there are Parsi, Parsi eating clubs. There is the old police building. It's all there. Uh -huh. So it's really a writer's delight to be able to work in a city where the historic preservation has been so excellent. One of the, one of the books, one of my favorite three books, I think, um, is A History of India um, by Jan Morris. Who who started writing? Who wrote these three books back when she was James Morris? Mm -hmm. And um, to me, those were one of the first books that I read, first nonfiction that I read about India. And she she does such a wonderful job um, bringing those bringing those periods to life. Uh, that I wondered if you were familiar with those or I haven't. I've heard about her, but I haven't read those. Yeah, um, we're in a special library today. The yes, Folio. we are. And one of the ways that I do the research for all of these books is I go to a special library in, of all places, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Really? The University of Minnesota has the, the largest collection of fine books about South Asia outside of India. Wow. It's called, it's called the Ames Library of South Asia. And it's like a freestanding library within a larger building. Uh -huh. You know, it's sort of like a, it's, it's part, it's like half a basement, I would uh -huh. say. But it's completely books about South Asia. Uh -huh. And when I go there, I'm able to walk through the stacks and pull out these old memoirs. And I have found memoirs of people that lived in British India, and there might have only been 10 of them printed, and yeah. one will be at the Ames Library. Wow. These very rare books, and I can find government records, and that's really how I get the flavor of what's going on. I mean, libraries like this are, are the lifeblood for a writer, yeah, especially definitely. someone writing historical fiction. Yeah. Oh, that's so, oh, now it makes me want to go see that oh, library. Oh, you have to go. I, as a, you must make a pilgrimage I, to the Ames Library. I, I love, um, <laughs> India is one of my favorite places to read about, and um, I, I just always welcome a new book about India that, that will help me understand and get into it. And so t when, with Purveen, so you wanted to make her a lawyer. And w when you wrote the first book, 
how how important is I mean plot is always important, especially in a mystery. But is is what was the hardest part about writing? Writing maybe well all your mysteries because I could never write a mystery because I I, I just don't think in terms of plot so I have great admiration <laughs> <laughs> for people who do. I for me the hardest part was devoting as much time as I did to her backstory. Uh -huh. The Widows of Malabar Hill, which is the first right. book in the series, is a mystery about um, it's about violence against women. Right. And, or, or women's rights, I should say. You know, violence against women is part of it, the threat of it, money being taken away from widows, um, people being confined in a section of the house. All of that is the, the, the act of story about, you know, what, what's going on in the death. Right. But in order to make it a more vivid story, I needed to write about why Perveen cared so much about women's rights and why as you know, a woman with an elite background, she wouldn't just go along and just do paperwork. Right. You know, Why do the paperwork so for the widows. To her. So for me, I had to kind of explore what had happened to her in a in a prior relationship, right. a romantic relationship, and and sort of bring the reader along in a way that um, it was interesting, but not not too horrifying. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, you had to give her. A, a reason for the direction that she's taking mm -hmm. and why she cares so much about yeah. these things. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and then in the new book, The Sad of Her Moonstone, you, you kind of involve her in what, what might be, as a reader says, um, might be the beginnings of a relationship. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. So I, do you outline for, you know, when you're doing these books? Do you know what the resolution is going to be? Um, I do outline. I might not know the resolution when I start my outline, but um, usually within a couple of months of writing, I can add that last bit in. Mm -hmm. But outlining is helpful for me. Um, it sort of, it helps me set up who are the characters and makes me think about their motivations. And that way they're not just like these stock pieces. Right. You know, th that's what separates mysteries, I think, that, you know, that there's a whole lot of emotion and motivation behind characters versus just like playing roles. I don't want to just write a who done it. Mm -hmm. I want to write why done it and um, create unforgettable characters that you want to meet with again. So right. outlining is is really helpful, but it, it the outline keeps getting revised. You know, I'm <laughs> working on a Perveen book right now and I continue returning to my outline and looking at it and thinking, oh, I should move this person into this scene to uh -huh. really move things along. Otherwise, my books could be too long. And that would be the kiss of death. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? They have to be, you think, a certain... Well, not... There are people I know that are asked to write to 70 or 80,000 word length. Uh -huh. I write, I tend to write a little bit longer, like more like 100,000, uh -huh. but 200,000 is too it's long. Too, right. That is too long. Right. I think the longest book that I've written was about 150,000 words, uh -huh. and that was The Sleeping Dictionary. Uh -huh. But, and that, that's a pretty long book. When, um, with Perveen and this, this relationship that might be happening mm -hmm. or not. One of the things that I like to ask mystery writers who are writing a series is, were there any decisions that you made in the first book about, about Praveen, about the main character, that you kind of regret that you made? I mean, the reason I, I'm asking that is that often you have um, a, a married detective, say, in, in the first book, and then it gets too, you sort of feel like the author's feeling, it gets a little too boring, so I need to, you know, too narrow. I, I don't have as big a scope with this married detective, so then the woman has, the wife has, to, or the husband has to die. Um, were there, I, were, yeah. I agree with you 100%. And I had the experience with my first mystery series with Ray Shimura uh -huh. that she met a wonderful man in the first book, <laughs> and then he was like her sidekick trailing along, and 
And then I got kind of tired of him. Yeah. But by then the readers had fallen in love with right. him. Right. So I, it's you don't want to create somebody that your readers fall in love with too much. Right. You know, unless it's like a child or a parent or a right. pet. Right. Yeah. You know, that right. that's fine. Yes. But but with a guy, because you might find that this is not, you know, that your heroine doesn't have as much freedom. Right. And, and you're locked right. in. And the thing about India's first women lawyers is there were two um, Indian women practicing law from, you know, there was one who started in the 1890s and one who started in the 20s. And the one who did not get married, who started in the 1890s, she had this long, robust career, almost 40 years of work. The one who did get married stopped after one year. So, you know, yeah. we think it probably had something to do with the society at the time. Right. And so it's not advantageous for Praveen Mystery to be married. Right. Because women didn't get the right to vote in England yeah. until the 30s. I mean, that was, I, I think, from my memory. I of can't that. remember the year. I cannot remember yeah, the year. I think it was the 30s. That women did vote in India. It was interesting, um, but the laws, and I think it was in the 30s, mm -hmm. so it must have been around the same time, but the laws were such that they could only vote if they were, uh, you know, property owners or, you know, so it was like it class-based voting, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know. Um, yes, so for, for Perveen to, to hold on to every right she has, including the right to work, is, is, it's really important to me. And, and was divorce allowed among Parsis? Divorce was allowed, but under very, very rare circumstances. Uh -huh. There had to be, there was a, a jury that would decide on it. And you couldn't divorce because you weren't getting along. Uh -huh. The divorce had to be for a particular set of characteristics. And one of them, one characteristic would be if the, um, one of the partners had relations with someone who was not a prostitute. Uh -huh. A prostitute wasn't enough. Right. Um, Physical violence wasn't enough unless you lost an eye or a limb. So all kinds of physical violence. It, yeah. it didn't cover rape. You know, you mm -hmm. could be raped by your partner. Yeah. And that wasn't a reason for divorce. So it was a very troubling situation. And the law did change in the 1930s. And the person who was the instigator of the change was one of those women lawyers I, I was mentioning, Mitan Tata Lam who was no longer practicing, but she devoted herself to women's rights. Oh, so like a suffragette almost. In, yeah, in, in a way she became yeah, like that yeah. and look at work advocating for women in India. Do you, do you feel like <clears throat> that, do you feel as though um, India is so large and the scope of, of the, the, the range that you could have for mysteries is so large that we're gonna see a lot of Praveen in the future. Yeah, it's very exciting <laughs> because I could see Praveen traveling to other places, other, right. you know, and, and I can also see just the the richness of Bombay. Right. That the the one I'm working on right now after Satapur Moonstone uh -huh. is set back inside Bombay. So a lot of her family will be involved and I'm looking into the world of colleges at the time and co-educational colleges specifically. Because Praveen went to, to school in England. Yes, she did. And before that, she was for briefly at a school in India and she had suffered a lot of harassment there. Right. And so she, she gets involved in a situation with female students and Oh, so that reminds me of a Josephine Tay, not, not, not. Oh, yeah, yeah, the one at the physical yes. education school. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah, that's a yeah. wonderful book. Miss, what is it called? Miss, Miss Pym, Pym Disposes. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. one of her best right. books. Right, right. So what are some other um, mystery writers that you really um, adore? Because I, too, adore Josephine Tay. Oh, so many are good. I would say that writing right now if you like indian mystery set in india abir mukherjee yes who lives in in britain is right. doing really excellent yes. work yeah with abir, those. yeah a beer a rising man a is rising man first is the first one. one and i think he's on maybe on his on third book third or now. fourth even yeah yes. i would recommend him um, I love I love mysteries with a sense of place. So uh -huh. the the Baltimore mysteries where I live, Baltimore, 
by Laura Lippman right. are absolutely wonderful. Yes, and I, her earlier series, the Tess Monahan mm -hmm. series, which is about a reporter at the Baltimore paper, mm -hmm. um, also gives you a, a good sense of Baltimore. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I enjoy, enjoy those mysteries uh -huh. as well. Uh -huh. So I love to read Ella Fair Burke. I think she's really great. Um, there's, I, I just kind of try to keep an eye on what's coming out and, and read what I can. Yeah. And I especially like to support women writers. That's what it sounds like. That's, that sounds great. Well, we're really looking forward to, um, I think I can speak for all mystery readers, um, we're really looking forward to seeing more of Praveen, and I'm especially interested in how you're going to handle relationships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. I don't yeah. want you to box yourself in too right. early. Well, I always say don't kill somebody off if you could use him or her again. Right, right. And there are so many... Um, there are so many writers who have really left their series, um, uh, their series character to go into standalones, like mm -hmm. Laura Lippman. Yeah. Do you see yourself doing that kind of thing? Well, I know I you've did done do standalone, stand -alone, right? But I'm really invested in the series uh -huh. right now. I'm emotionally invested. I just adore these characters, and I see so many potential stories in Bombay that I, I really think Praveen is going to have a hold on me for a long time. Well, that's great, because she certainly had a hold on me. Oh, thank you, Nancy. <laughs> thank you so much, Suchata Massey, for coming by and talking, us, talking to me and us today. It was my pleasure to be here. Good. Good.